In this video, I'm gonna look at Pixar's famous 22 rules for storytelling, and we'll have a bit of a rapid fire chat about each tip in turn. I wanna say thanks to Copester1204 for prompting me to look into these a little bit further. These tips were originally tweeted by former Pixar writer, and I think maybe artist, Emma Coates. So let's get started. Number one, you admire a character for trying more than for their successes. Absolutely agree with this one. It's way easier to empathize with someone who's trying something. Seeing a character work hard or overcome adversity lets us know what they're made of. And those are qualities that we admire and we look for in ourselves and that draws us towards a character. Just seeing someone successful with no explanation of how they got to that point isn't as compelling, I don't think. And it even puts you at risk of creating the opposite effect and causing your audience to resent that character. That might not happen too often, but it's definitely something to think about. By the way, if this is your first time here, welcome. I'm Kieran, I'm a writer and a freelance editor, and I love helping writers tell their stories and have fun while doing it. Number two, you gotta keep in mind what's interesting to you as an audience, not what's fun to do as a writer they can be very different. This is a good tip too, especially if you're looking to get published. There definitely is a big difference between those two things. It's an unfortunate but unavoidable fact, I think. This is a problem I've always had with trying to get published. Whenever I've approached agents, they've always mentioned that they like my work, but nobody's buying it, nobody's selling it. There isn't a market for the kind of stuff that I write. So that's kind of forced me off that track. But if you're just writing for you, with no concerns about publishing at all, then maybe this one doesn't matter as much but still, I don't know, because it's always nice to feel like you've written something that another person would enjoy or connect with anyway, even taking all the commercial stuff out of it. Surely there's no self-expression without somebody to express to. Number three, trying for theme is important, but you won't see what the story is actually about till you're at the end of it. Now rewrite. I very much agree here, maybe it's just how I write and it's more about method than anything else, but I feel like the message and the themes of my work is rarely completely intentional from, you know, word one. Stuff often just develops as I'm going along that I then lean into later in the second draft, exactly as she says. I feel like that gives my writing a more cohesive feel than if I tried to steer it towards saying something in particular from the off, but like I said, that's just mainly my method, I think. I don't plan a huge amount when I write, just the main bits and the ending. So maybe if you plan more and you know everything that's gonna happen in your story, you can find a way to weave the theme into it from the opening paragraph. Number four, once upon a time, there was blank. Every day, blank. One day, blank. Because of that, blank. Because of that, blank. Until finally, blank. I've never said blank so much in my life. This is the famous Pixar story structure, as, as far as I know. Does it apply to every single story? Probably not, but I don't think it's gonna steer you too far wrong. And what I like about this is that it's really accessible. You could take this completely at face value and enter your words in those gaps. And while it might not build your entire story and all its intricacies, it would certainly be a foundation that you could build from, I think. What it could also do is teach us a bit about deconstructing stories we could take some of our favorite stories and see if they fit into this format. And from that, I think we can learn something valuable. For example, if we look at one of my favorites, No Country for Old Men, once upon a time there was a welder, every day he went hunting. One day he found a suitcase of money. Because of that, some criminals came after him. Because of that, he had to run until finally, they caught him. I just want to take a few seconds to remind you about the developmental editing service that I run on my website. If you've got a piece of a novel or some short fiction that you really would like some feedback on, check out the link in the description or scan the QR code on screen. Right, back to the video. Number five, simplify, focus, combine characters, hop over detours. You'll feel like you're losing valuable stuff, but it sets you free. I'd agree with this one too, I think. Often what holds me back when I'm writing a story, especially a novel, is that I'm holding on to something that I think I need or something I really just want to put in there, but the story would actually, in reality, be better without it. It's that killing your darlings thing, I guess, that, that old advice, but in a more practical sense. This has happened to me a few times when I'm writing novels, and it's hard to realize that that's what's going on while you're in the thick of it, because you feel like all of these elements are really, really important to have in there, and that the book just isn't gonna be what you thought it was without them, but that's true. It's not gonna be what you thought it was, but chances are it might actually be better. So definitely experiment with stuff. Cut something that you think you desperately might need and it will change the shape of your story. It's up to you then to figure out whether that's for better or for worse. Number six, what's your character good at, comfortable with? Throw the polar opposite at them, challenge them. How do they deal? 
This takes us back a bit to the first tip about trying rather than succeeding. I think empathy in readers is drawn from seeing characters in tough situations. Life quite often knocks us down a peg or two. So when we see that reflected in stories, we feel like, yeah, been there. Also, if there's no challenge to a character, there's no tension. There's nothing for a reader to wonder about. Knowing how it all ends up, or even knowing exactly how it all ends up, is what gives most readers motivation to keep reading. Throwing obstacles in your character's way definitely helps with that. Number seven, come up with your ending before you figure out your middle. Seriously, endings are hard. Get yours working up front. This one might depend on what kind of writer you are, I suppose, and how much planning you do. And note that I said how much planning you do, not whether you do or don't. I find it's rarely as simple as fully planning or completely free writing. There is a spectrum there. This tip is close to my approach. I always know the ending of a book pretty early on and then I work towards that however I can. I find that I have to know what the ending is gonna be in order to steer the story correctly and to lay down hints and establish themes or try to in the first draft. But your mileage may vary, of course. My way is no more valid than anybody else's. Number eight, finish your story. Let go even if it's not perfect. In an ideal world, you'll have both, but move on, do better next time. Yes, absolutely, very good point to make. Done is better than perfect because perfect is unattainable. It's not really an option. Waiting for something to be perfect will mean waiting in all likelihood forever and seeing none of the achievement of calling a story finished. The do better next time bit might sound a bit negative here as well, as though you haven't done well this time, but I don't think it actually is. For me, it means take what you no doubt learned from your story and apply it again, build things up, make every story stronger for as long as you can. Don't stop learning, and most importantly, don't call any piece of writing a waste of time, because it wasn't. You're a better writer for having written it, whether it's good or not. Number nine, when you're stuck, make a list of what wouldn't happen next. Lots of times the material to get you unstuck will show up. I've seen this tip before and it always strikes me as a really good idea, but I've just never put it into practice myself. If you have, let me know in the comments if it worked for you. It does seem like it would work as you'd be eliminating all the things that are illogical for your character or for the story. But I honestly don't know if that necessarily leads you to something that does make logical sense or not. I'm, I'm not really sure. Something I need to try for myself and I'm definitely keen to. Number 10, pull apart the stories you like. What you like in them is a part of you. You've got to recognize it before you can use it. I like this one a lot. It's a bit different. And I think I've actually done this a fair amount on this channel, as you might have seen. There are a few videos about my favorite stories or authors, and I've absolutely learned things that I've taken forward and tried to apply to my own writing. The way this is phrased is what I really like about it though, how she said that what you like in those stories is a part of you. That's a really helpful way to frame it because it's a bit deeper than, I like this, so I'm gonna use it in my own story, which can often make us feel as though we're copying or stealing work when really that's just not the case. Nothing is entirely original. We are all made up of our influences. You can't avoid it but recognizing that something is a part of you rather than something you just felt like stealing is a better way to look at it, a more healthy way to look at it, I think. 11, putting it on paper lets you start fixing it. If it stays in your head, a perfect idea, you'll never share it with anyone. Very much so. The most popular video on my channel is about how to just get started writing, and that's designed to push people past that internal planning stage and start putting something down whatever you can. Lately, I'm finding brainstorming really helpful there. Creating a kind of mind map for stories helps me feel excited about them and helps me see problems coming and account for them. But I think if you make a mind map or if you write notes or even if you just jump straight into writing the first line, you're still bringing your story to life. You're making it a real thing rather than just something that exists in your head. And I definitely always recommend doing that. There's always mileage in a story that you just can't get at when it's all wrapped up in your head. You need to spread it out in front of you and pick through it and see what's there. Number 12, discount the first thing that comes to mind and the second, third, fourth, fifth. Get the obvious out of the way, surprise yourself. This is a hard one for me, I think, if I'm being totally honest. I'm not so flush with ideas that I can afford to dismiss that many. However, I do think that rejecting the very first thing that comes to your head is a really good advice. Whether that's a bit of dialogue or a plot point or something, most often, the first thing that shows itself is something that 
is likely to be anticipated or expected. It could be a trope in some form, or as she says, something obvious. Avoiding that, I think, definitely makes stories better. From a practical sense, the way I think I put this into practice is to just pause every now and again. While I'm in that flow state of writing, I can just keep going and going and going. All this stuff's getting front loaded and then I'm just writing it out. But there definitely needs to be some thought intervention at some point. You need to stop and just think about whether this is the right path that you're going down. And it's not just that you're writing what's easy because that can definitely happen. So every now and again, take a minute, think about what you're writing and maybe you can avoid something obvious. Number 13, give your characters opinions. Passive, malleable, might seem likable to you as you write, but it's poison to the audience. Really good insight here again. The neutral, fence-sitting protagonist will wind your audience up. They'll end up screaming, say something, have an opinion. I think it's actually possible that a character who shows the opposite opinion to a reader has a better chance of being engaging and likable than an overly compliant or totally neutral character with no opinion. I'd rather root for a villain that knows what they want than a good guy who's just bumbling along and doesn't really mind. Number 14, why must you tell this story? What's the belief burning within you that your story feeds off of? That's the heart of it. This is great to consider for a couple of reasons. Firstly, for those writers for whom storytelling is self-expression and sending a message, this is a key motivator to them. It's the reason they write and tapping into that can bring them energy and purpose and can help sustain them through a long project. But also for writers who just like writing stories, don't underestimate the love you have for that. You may not want to change the world. You may not be looking to make a massive point about humanity. Maybe you don't think that big. I don't, to be perfectly honest. But you still have passion and drive and that is still the heart of your story. You could be doing nothing right now, but instead you're working on making your writing better just by watching me go on and on. So that counts for something in my mind. Number 15, if you were your characters in this situation, how would you feel? Honesty lends credibility to unbelievable situations. This is a really great reminder of how important honesty is in writing, I think. I won't say much on this one because I'd just be saying the same thing in a much less concise way. The only thing I'd add though is that it's great to think about this, particularly when you're writing dialogue. Honestly, what would you say and how would you say it? Reject that first answer. Think honestly and write that. Number 16, what are the stakes? Give us reasons to root for the character. What happens if they don't succeed? Stack the odds against. In my editing work, this is a common thing that comes up. I don't edit full novels, honestly, because to make it worthwhile for me to do, I'd have to charge way more than I'm comfortable charging, and it wouldn't be good value for writers, I don't think. Instead, my approach is to edit the first 5,000 words and give advice and feedback that's aimed to be sustainable throughout the rest of the book. Things writers can take away and apply to the rest of their work if they've written it or if they've yet to. And it's often the case that there needs to be a stronger hook in those first 5,000 words. There needs to be stakes, a reason to explain why we're with the character, why they're worth following, why they're interesting enough or their situation is interesting enough. You might have a fantastic story planned and it might go to all kinds of unexpected places, but the reader doesn't really know that to start with. So if you don't have that hook, you're kind of asking readers to bear with you and the harsh reality is they often won't do that but a question at the very beginning a setup that piques a reader's interest that can be enough to keep them going wait they're trying to do what well that's not going to work surely because of this how are they going to do that when this and if this is true how can they this if you can get something like that in or something along those lines as soon as you can and in prominent place, it gives logic to your story and it sort of sells your reader on why they're there and makes it less likely that they'll move on, I think. Number 17, no work is ever wasted. If it's not working, let go and move on. It'll come back around to be useful later. I'm a firm believer in this. I've talked about this concept a load of times in my famous author advice videos, but it bears repeating, I think. No effort is wasted, whether it's actual writing or planning or researching, it all moves you forward until it doesn't. At the point where you're really not making any progress and nothing you try is helping at all, that's when it's time to put it aside. It might not be forever, but even if it is, it's not a waste because you still learn something. So if you've exhausted all avenues and you're just getting frustrated when you sit down to write, definitely change it up a bit. Number 18, you have to know yourself. The difference between doing your best and fussing. Story is testing, not refining. This one's a bit different. 
though really important, I think. Once you have this one, once you have this down, a lot of other problems in your writing don't really bother you as much as they once did. Those problems are always still there, but you can just sort of look at them out of the window as you pass by instead of stopping. I know I'll never write something as hard to put down as those thrillers like The Girl on the Train or whatever. It's just not my forte. I know myself. No amount of fussing would get me there. Same with something like romance. I just wouldn't know where to start. Doing my best versus fussing is an eternal struggle for me that expands beyond just whatever I'm working on right now. I've got a book ready to go. It's called Project Ventus. I've done the cover, I've done all the front matter, the back matter and the novel itself. Well, that's been done for a while, but I do still want to edit it more, of course, but that would just be fussing because I think it's okay. There's a possibility, there's a few typos in there that I've just somehow missed after five or six edits, but that's not really what I mean. I think I'm also fussing over it because it's really hard to release work and accept that it'll be judged. I make all of these videos about writing and though I'd love to believe that everyone who watches them takes what I say with a grain of salt and listens when I say, this is just my opinion and nothing more. In reality, I don't think it quite works like that. I'm sure someone will say to me, on page 400 of your book, you used an adverb, but in your videos, you say, don't use them. There's nothing I can do about that. All I have to ask is, have I done my best? Because no amount of fussing can get us any further than that. And right now I feel like I have. I could probably write a better book, I think, but to continue writing book after book and hoping they'll get better and better and never showing them to anyone, which is what I've been doing, is a cycle that I wanna get out of. It's a fussing cycle and I need to just cut that cycle short. So I will, coming this April, Project Ventus. Feel free to read it if you would like to. I'll post a bit of a promo video about it when I set it live as well, but I've got to stop fussing. Number 19, coincidences to get characters into trouble are great. Coincidences to get them out of it are cheating. This is great. Again, not much I can add to this really because it's already so well put, but write this one down next time you're planning a novel. The last thing we want to do is make readers roll their eyes as a meteorite falls from the sky and bonks the bad guy on the head. Anyone can write that and we're not just anyone, we're us. Number 20, exercise. Take the building blocks of a movie you dislike. How do you rearrange them into what you do like? This sounds like another exercise that I should probably do. Figuring out exactly what it is you don't like about something can be just as valuable for your own writing as what you do like. What not to do is probably the easiest thing you can learn from other stories. I'd imagine if you can broadly identify what it is that you don't like pretty quickly, then you can probably get some real value from drilling down and down further into the story until you really get to the root of the thing and the reason you don't like it. And I think that's where the gold is probably found. Number 21, you gotta identify with your situation slash characters. Can't just write cool. What would make you act that way? Could just be me, but I feel like this one could perhaps have been written more clearly. But what I'm taking from it is that she's talking about the logic of characters and situations, and it all comes down to choices, I think. The often cited example of this is horror movies where the characters run past the open front door and up the stairs instead. Though a bit exaggerated, obviously, the concept is there. It's frustrating to watch characters do things that in reality nobody would ever do. A character's instinct when faced with a choice needs to be the same as ours if possible, or if not, motivated by something. They need to choose this because and avoid that because. And because it moves the plot along is not quite enough, I'm afraid. Again, I could have interpreted this tip wrong, but that's why I'm taking from it. And number 22, what's the essence of your story? Most economical telling of it. If you know that, you can build out from there. I was talking earlier about brainstorming ideas and how I find that really helpful. And I also mentioned that little story formula in tip number four. I think we could put both to good use here to find the essence of our story. Make a mind map of all the elements you can think of and then write a basic formula like that. The barest essentials of the story. And I think that would be really useful. There'd be two resources that you could have as you approach building the story. Stuff like that definitely could help you learn something about your story that you didn't already know. I just posted a video about C.S. Lewis. Some of his advice I thought was really nicely phrased and useful too, so why not watch that one next? As always, I want to say thank you so much for watching and happy writing.